If you've ever been disillusioned, disappointed, or discouraged in your search for love, and you know there has to be a better way to find the healthy, soul-filling love you've always longed for, then you've discovered the podcast for you. I know, as Ken's work personally has led me to find the love of my life. So here's your host of Deeper Dating, Ken Page. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Deeper Dating Podcast. I'm Ken Page. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm the author of the best-selling book, Deeper Dating, the creator of the Deeper Dating Intensive, and your host on this podcast. And today, I'm so excited to get to interview Dr. Judith Orloff, author of the new book, The Genius of Empathy. And she's going to be speaking to us about harnessing and working with the challenges of this magical and powerful capacity for empathy that changes our lives. In this episode and every episode of the Deeper Dating Podcast, I'm going to share with you the greatest tools and insights that I know to help you find healthy love and keep it flourishing and heal your life in the process because the skills of dating are the skills of love, which are the greatest skills of all for a meaningful and happy life. And if you want to learn more about the Deeper Dating Path to Intimacy, just go to deeperdatingpodcast.com and there you you can get some wonderful free resources as well as transcripts of every episode. So let me tell you about Dr. Judith Orloff. Dr. Judith Orloff, MD, is a psychiatrist, an empath, and the author of the new book, The Genius of Empathy, which offers powerful skills to tap into empathy as a daily healing practice in your life and relationships. She also wrote The Empath's Survival Guide and Thriving as an Empath. Dr. Orloff is a New York Times bestselling author and a UCLA clinical faculty member. She synthesizes the pearls of conventional medicine with cutting-edge knowledge of intuition, energy, and spirituality. Dr. Orloff specializes in treating highly sensitive people in her private practice, and she's been featured on the Today Show, CNN, Oprah Magazine, and the New York Times. And you can learn more about Empaths and Empathy at www.drjudithorloff.com. That's D-R-J-U-D-I-T-H-O-R-L-O-F-F. So without further ado, let me introduce Judith. So, Judith, I am honored and delighted to have you on this show. And I think that your message and your insights fit this audience in a powerful, powerful way. So um, thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. So I'm just going to jump in with my questions. So first of all, so much of your beautiful body of work has been around the subject of empathy and being an empath and surviving in the world. Can you say something about the evolution of this book and how that relates to your personal and professional story, why this book needed to be written by you now? Yes, great question. Well, the book is called The Genius of Empathy, and I wanted it to come out right now because empathy is the missing ingredient to our better relationships, better dating, and our relationships in the global world. We need to bring empathy in as the missing piece. Without empathy, if you're not expressing empathy in your relationships or your dating or anywhere else, they are not going to go very well. Empathy is so powerful because it Mm. lets people feel seen, feel heard, feel valued, even if you don't agree with them. And so empathy is what we need the most now. And I am passionate about traveling around and sharing this with people and helping people with the resistances to it and also how to tap into it and towards themselves as well. There's a chapter on self-empathy. Yes, yes. And I've got questions for you on that, too, because that's such an important piece. Thank you. And I I agree so deeply. Our world is being so fractured at this point and polarized. And uh, 
that's such a dangerous thing. And empathy is such a beautiful and essential book. So I really get it that now is a really good time for this to be shared with the world. So can you speak a little bit about how empathy is actually a gift, how it's even a superpower, and how it heals? All right. I'm a, a psychiatrist, and I've gone through 14 years of medical training at USC and UCLA, and I'm also an empath. And so I combine my empathic skills with my traditional medical skills to enhance patient care, basically. I use it in my private practice. And this is a healing technique to bring empathy into anything. You're igniting the healing energy. Mm. And the healing energy is what comes from your heart. It's not what comes from your head necessarily. It means listening to somebody, listening to yourself. If you go through something, let's say you have a terrible dating experience or you, you get treated with disrespect. The first thing you do is you focus self-empathy on an inner dialogue of saying, this was horrible. This is, I don't deserve to be treated this way. This was unfortunate. I'm not going to repeat it. I feel for you. I know what you're going to. And you talk to yourself like you're a precious being. That's the first thing. When you come upon emotional hurt or bad behavior, talk to yourself first. So that's where empathy can be healing, as opposed to what I know most do is they beat themselves up. Yes. You know? And what did I do to contribute to this? Why did they do this to to me? And they get into victim role, and they're not able to find their deeply empathic, loving self, which we need to find. And it's almost counterintuitive that we we have such a hard time finding it. You'd think self-empathy would be the first thing we'd want. No, but it isn't. You know, we would prefer to beat ourselves up, but most people go to that place. And so that's why it's important as a healing practice to condition yourself to practice self-empathy when things happen, as opposed to coming down on your precious self, which is you. You, 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 need, you need to connect to your precious self. And... Mm -hmm. um, so it's you and you, the relationship between you and you is number one relationship, you know. I and so agree. So, yeah. And so the self-empathy creates the healing response to any kind of difficult situation. So that's a place to start. Could you just give us maybe some more guidance around how you do that? Like, for example, do you... Put your hand anywhere in your body. Do you say this out loud or is it just as effective to think it or to write it? How do we, we come out of a bad experience. What do we do? Like really concretely, how do we turn this into a direct practice? Well, the practice of empathy is first understanding, identifying your real feelings. Like this felt horrible. I hated this. I feel <laughs> miserable. I hate this person. I mean, just get to the bottom line. If this person was so rude, how could they treat me? You know, get get to that. And see, what a lot of people do is they bypass that state because they don't think it's it's okay. You know, it's not spiritually correct. But if you can never get to self empathy or self healing unless you deal with the real feelings first. But you so let it rip. Let her rip. You you have to. You have to because we all uh -huh. feel that way. We you know we get hurt. We you know, our animal instincts come out. You no, know, we just you know are angry and and anyways we need to be honest with what what we're feeling and not with the person necessarily, but at least with your own journal, with your own mm -hmm. self, your own heart, and say this was just the worst. I'm so sorry you had to go through this. And you talk to yourself in in this way. And then you said, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to do any work right now. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to listen to my intuition. I'll take a bubble bath. You know, I'll light some candles. I'll go for a hike. I'll get a massage. I'll just be nice to myself by putting my hand over my heart and activating the heart chakra, which is in the middle of the chest, a technique that I talk about in this book as a way of coming back to yourself after difficult things happen. 
And it's an energetic way to come back to yourself by putting your hand on your heart chakra right here, focusing on something you love and saying, we'll work this out. This was horrible. We'll work it out. We'll get through this. You know, feelings are not facts. Feelings are temporary and they come and they go. And this is the pits and we'll get through this. So you have to talk to yourself in a very loving way, as opposed to you really blew that. What did you do wrong to get this person so angry with you and so nasty? What did you do? Because you come from parents like that who blamed you and criticized you and put you down, especially if you're an empath and said, oh, you're too sensitive or you know, you have to develop a thicker skin, like my parents said. So I grew up with a lot of shame about being an empath. Yes. Uh, you might, at first, the first try is to get, come down on yourself. That's what your instinct is. But that's where you have to notice, this is what I usually do. And this is what I'm going to stop doing. So I have to recondition my own thinking to deal with difficult or disappointing or hurtful situations in a different way. And, you know, my spiritual teacher, who is a Taoist, says that um, when you beat yourself up a little bit less each day, it's a sign of spiritual progress. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. 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 So something just a little bit adjacent to that. You come out of a really difficult situation, a conflict, but you realize that you were not skillful or you hurt somebody else and you're viscerally aware that you really did something that you don't feel good about. Any thought for the words that we can use for ourselves when, when, when we're experiencing that? Oh, oh, yes. I mean, in empathy, you have to, in the book, I talk about making empathy statements. And this means to yourself and to somebody else, how do you word something so that it can get through to somebody else or get through to yourself? And uh. yeah, and the reality of life is that we make mistakes. We do things that we're not proud of. We speak in ways we wish we could take back. And this is the nature of learning. But what you brought up, Ken, which is so important, is that you realize it. You don't try and blame somebody else for this. You don't, you're accountable. You know, empathy means you're compassionate and you're accountable. We all make mistakes. Don't, everyone who's listening, don't feel ashamed of making a mistake. We all make them. And it's part of our learning process of being human beings here on earth is that we make mistakes and then the beauty of, of making a mistake is that you'll have a chance to make amends. Um, and there's yes. a chapter in here on empathy and forgiveness and what that actually means and how to let go of resentments rather than hold on to them. A, a very powerful empathy tool is letting go of resentments. And it takes some conditioning to do that. And I go through how to do that because people just say, oh, I'm done. I'm done with it. it, it this is, these are all a healing practices to let go of resentment. It's a huge healing triumph, you know, as far as Beautiful. I'm concerned. Yeah. I so agree. And now I have to ask you to tell us what that practice is. But before you do, I just want to say something about what you just said, which I think is just so it, it opened a door for me when you said it, which is that the degree to which I'm able to see my unskillful, unhelpful, uncompassionate behavior and talk to myself still with empathy and compassion, acknowledging that, but somehow, like you said, being able to get through to the inner child, to be able to like talk about that, hold it with goodness. The degree to which I can do that then probably helps me be able to do that with my loved ones when I see what they've done that is not good or not right or not helpful or not skillful and vice versa. When I can see that in them and learn to talk to them in that way, then probably I can learn to talk to me in that way too. So yes. what a universal skill that is. Yes, absolutely. Is that but but you have to accept that these things will happen. You will make a mistake. You will disappoint loved ones. And you don't want to, but 
you have a chance to be accountable, number one, to show empathy for yourself and say, I made a terrible mistake and I'm going to make amends to this person and just say, I, I am so sorry I hurt you. I was triggered. I was not in my most empowered self. And I said something I regret. I wish I could take it back. And I'm so sorry I hurt you. And I didn't mean it. Not really. I didn't mean it. I just, it just came out. You know, and, you know, I would I would do things like. Fair, I have my own triggers, but big trigger is when I'm stressed out. If too many things are coming at me too fast, I tend to say something that I regret, you know, um, and with my partner, I would say something like, you know, what we were I was doing some remodel work on the house, which for empaths is just a terrible nightmare for me to have that many people around, you know, and, yes. and always wanting something, you know, they always want something. So I'm on edge, you know, not, I'm not my normal self. And when I get that way, you no, know, I, I say, I can't be in a relationship. That's where I go. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, you want to say that to your beloved, you know, that's like, and he goes, you don't? I go, oh, I didn't mean it. I didn't. Yeah, so I, I was able to take it back. But you now we've come to an agreement when I get overwhelmed. Like, <laughs> he said, I think you need to take some time alone. And that's yes. really helpful to me. And I go, you're right. I do. And so no more talk. When I'm in that state or when you're in that state, everyone listening, you get into a high stress state and you might blurt out things that shouldn't be blurted out really. Um, and so to prevent that, you need to have a plan. When I get in these states, how can I show empathy for my partner, for whoever, and myself? And the most empathic thing I can do is remove myself from the situation, zip it up and go into another room and meditate, take a bath, Decrease stimulation, which is really important for empaths. As if you're sensitive, you need to bring it mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. You can't, the drama will go way up if you continue in that state. So you have to learn to stop yourself and say, all right, I'm going to get in big trouble if I continue here with this. So I'm going to take a break. It's a time out. It's, and, and you could prepare the other person if you're, you know, if, if you're intimate with them, you could say, I get in these states and I found that it's best when I'm in these states to remove myself and then we could re hook up later. Yeah. You know, yeah. That kind of thing. That's an empathic act. Yes, yes. And and would you say that that's particularly true for us empaths that that we can experience sensory overload uh, kind of easily or when there's a lot of pressure or 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 we just sense a lot going on in the room that we get overwhelmed? Absolutely. But part yeah. of the empathic techniques that I'm writing about are how to identify that. So you you just nip it in the in the bud. You, you feel it growing. I could feel it in my solar plexus, this overwhelm, the tightness, or I start getting snippy, or I start getting, you know, or I, and, and I just need to get away. You so you've just away. described behavior and also a body experience that are indicators that, that, that it's kind of getting to be too much. Right. If everybody, you know, can, you can go to that part in the book and you can focus on your body to train your body when you begin to go on overload and sensory Beautiful. sensory overload is very painful and you don't want to get to that place i get there in airports sometimes because it's hard to control mm -hmm. the energy in airports because it's so crazy especially if the the flight is late you know so it's harder for me as an empathic person to be in in airports so i can do it but not if i have to wait hours and hours that will the setup for me to get going to sensory overload, you see. So I, I try and just be kind to myself if I can't escape a situation and I show empathy or I go in the corner. That's my big coping mechanism and is to go in the corner somewhere and put my purse next to me so that, you know, the sign is to stay away to other people so I could close my eyes, take a deep breath, focus on my heart and center myself in those situations and then when i get home to really take care of myself so if you're in a situation let's say you're in a conference 
or even if you're out on a date and it's not going well. You yeah, know? you know what? If I could just if I could just um, stage sure. this for you so that you could talk about it in this kind of way. Like the world of dating is such a painful world, and there's so much unkindness and ghosting and unthoughtfulness and as well as the loneliness that kind of informs so much of that and all the different feelings. So if you could maybe talk about that, like all of the kind of overloads and pains and discomforts that happen in this crazy wild west of dating oh, and how we can, how we can build empathy for ourselves. Um, well, you know, it happens. It's a, everything that you just said is true. <laughs> um, but. What you need to do is not arrange a lot of dates at once uh -huh. you know, to not overload yourself. You need to do one at a time and see how it goes. Um, and when you, you know, if you're dating online and when you look at the profiles, you need to look for signs of empathy in the profile. Oh, and beautiful. Say more about that. I have never heard it said that way. That's really big. Yeah. Could you say more about that? Yeah, sometimes I go if my if my clients are are dating, you know, if the couple of them I've gone over how to do an intuitive reading of somebody on the, you know, on the site and how to see signs of empathy and what they they present. So it's very important to do that because she would, you know, see a picture and show it to me. And says, "What about this? He's so cute," you know, and and you know he would be having a drink in his hand. I go. Yes. Yeah. No. look there's a sign he has a picture he has a drink in his hand that's a red flag oh i didn't see the drink you know so to to be able to train people to, to see clearly you know for one thing and look for people if they're if they're of service you know let's say they're you know they love nature and so they're doing something to help the earth or they're doing something to help someone other than themselves yes. you know or caring for their their parents or they love flowers or um, if that see the pieces of music they're attracted to, you know, it, and, and see what kind of music, if it's um, meditation music or if they're meditators, you know, you, you look for, for signs. You don't want to go for those who are partying all the time unless you want that. You know, it just depends on what you're looking for. You know, if you're Beautiful, looking yeah. Yeah, party all the time. There's that too, but you have to really look at the the profile, you know, and really feel what's in the background. Is it something I'm attracted to? Is it, you know, does their voice sound kind? This person, you know, in terms of how they're writing. So you need to look at it with more discrimination so rather true. than just what they look like. So true. And you mentioned meditation. And I just want to mention that the foreword to this book is written by the Dalai Lama. Yeah. So that says so much right there. So Judith, I want to go back to what you said about forgiveness. You were going to help us with some tools around forgiveness. And I don't want to lose that. All right. Well, part of an expression of empathy is forgiveness, whether you're forgiving yourself or, or another person. All right. And I am personally as an empath and all you empaths must know this, that if you carry around a resentment, they just build over the years. And especially as you age, if you're carrying around tons of resentments, it affects your aging process. You don't have that light, that useful, you know, light anymore. You have this, oh, you know, kind of misery of um, bitterness that all these people did you wrong. And you have a right to hold on to it. And it's all true. You do have a right to hold on to it. But go go for it if you want to hold on to it. But you pay a price. And the price is, is that it affects your health. It affects your view of the world. You keep repeating these boring stories over and over and over and over again to people about how you've been wronged. And you start alienating people. So I don't think it's a good way to go. And one of the themes of the genius of empathy is that we try to have empathy even for people we don't like and even for or we disagree with and even for even if we can for people who wronged us. And by this, I want to make very clear, I don't mean having empathy for the act. If they betrayed you, if they hurt you physically, if they stole your money, I'm not saying forgive them for that. But what empathy does, it takes your heart 
stretches it one step further so you could have empathy for the suffering or the woundedness or the cluelessness that was motivating this person. That was so beautifully said. That was so beautifully said. The magic healing formula that happens when you do that is that you detach from the person. So you're not carrying them around in your mind anymore. It just happens when you do something like that and do that counter move of, I'm going to have empathy for your suffering and I'm really going to try. And it doesn't mean I'm forgiving what you did. That gives you distance. It clears up. Suddenly you could see more of the sky and you could see more of the stars. You're not just seeing that person who harmed you. So it helps detach you from the act so you could move on. Oh, so beautifully said. Yeah. yeah. And I love this concept of not necessarily that you even have to fully forgive, that a way to think about this task is just stretching your heart into empathy somewhat more. And every bit more that you stretch it. You know, my dad, and this is something I've talked about as a Holocaust survivor, and he said that the very hate that kept him alive during the during his concentration camp time, he realized that that hate would kill him if he didn't get rid of it. And he said it took him half a century. But he said every time he felt it, he would pull it out of him and try to get rid of it piece by tiny piece. And for those of us who have been deeply, deeply wounded, I love that imagery of being able to just do it piece by piece, little bit by little bit, to have that visceral experience of, as you described, like this enlarging this expanding of your heart yes and i want to say to everyone you don't have to do it this is not something you force empathy is something you want to go after it's not something you ever force or if it Beautiful. doesn't right and it's perfectly fine if you never want to do it if somebody really hurt you you don't have to do it so sure off yourself but if there's something in you that's curious about what I'm saying, or if there's a little instinct going, hmm, maybe she's right. <laughs> maybe I'll give, maybe I'll give it a try. So then you go go towards it. But you don't have to do this. You know, you don't you don't have to forgive in this way. There there are levels of forgiveness. There's someone who stole your parking space. Yes, you want to forgive them. <laughs> You don't want to carry that around. That's ridiculous. You know, but, you know, if you had abusive parents, do you want to forgive them? That's up to you. You know, you so only true. you and your intuitive heart know that. And I have patients that, I, you know, I write about this in the book because it's really interesting that many of my patients have been in the situation where they were abused by their parents. And when the parents were terminal, they were called to take care of the parent as they passed on. And they would come to me and go, Judith, what should I do here? These people, you know, were horrible to me. What do you say? Yeah, I say, this is your intuitive call. If you decide to not do it, that's perfectly fine. You don't owe them anything. And if you decide to do it, that's fine too. You go forward and you help them. And so as your karma is clear with them, if they abused you and you've healed and you've had a healing life for yourself and you've emerged, mm. you don't have to do anything else. You really don't. And to do it out of guilt, it will be a miserable experience. But if you do it because oddly you feel like it, despite everything they've done, then you go do it. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the patients who've decided to go do it, they were happy with their choice. And the patients who decided not to do it, they were happy with their choice. So this is so your powerful. call. So powerful. I know we're moving toward closing, but another question I want to ask you is just as a doctor, neurologically, physiologically, Tell us some things about what happened to us when we open up to deeper empathy. How does that affect our brains and our bodies and our our our, our physical hearts and our well-being? You what open up empathy. Us? 
you stimulate your vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is your friend. That's the parasympathetic nervous system, which uh, quiets you down, which helps you feel bliss, which helps you feel contentedness, as opposed to the sympathetic, which are the neurochemicals such as cortisol and adrenaline that you know make you frightened and you know upset all the time and stressed out and age you more quickly. So when you're showing empathy, you're activating this vagus nerve, which is one of the biggest nerves in the body, and you want to feel that calmness as opposed to the drama and the frenzy. So it activates your parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve, which is something you know I, I have in the book how to, how other ways to activate it besides empathy, you know such as cold plunges, you know and, and other things that will activate it, but that will calm you down. And part of one of the tool healing tools of the book is how do you calm down in a chaotic world? Very important, calm down. So that's what you know your the gift of the body when you empathize. You know, what I love about your approach and why I really encourage everybody to get this book is because it, it captures this from the spiritual angle, the physiological angle, the relational angle, and also speaks in such deep and powerful ways about empathy as a tool for self-love, which is so, so important. Judith, I have about a million more questions for you, but the one question that I'm going to close with is, what do you want to leave this audience with? If there was one thing that you most wanted to say to this community of people that cares deeply about intimacy in their lives? Hmm. To let your empathy and your empath nature shine and to not feel there's anything to be ashamed of or that you've done anything wrong because you haven't. And I'm so sorry you were hurt. I'm so sorry that your parents or whoever didn't see you as you deserve to be seen and loved and, and taught to develop this gift. But however, not all people are given that. So you must start as an adult and you can give yourself that and you can attract friends and lovers and, you know, uh, people, peripheral people in your life who can support that in you. So it's, um, you know, it's really a beautiful direction to walk. And that's why I wrote this book. And I hope you can honor this in yourself. So beautifully said. And I think you're going to touch the lives of so many people with this book, which is going to be available on April 9th. So you could pre-order it. And Judith, how can people learn more about you and your body of work? And how can they find you and learn more about you? Well, my website is drjudithorloff.com, drjudithorloff.com. Um, um, my launch book event is in Venice, California at Mystic Journeys in Santa Monica on April 13th. You're all invited. I don't know where you are, but you're all invited to come to it. And I have other um, book events on my website under my lecture schedule. And I'd love to see you there. I'd love to have this conversation with you and expand the conversation on empathy. Um, and I also have an empath support newsletter, a monthly newsletter that's free that you could sign up for. It's um, wonderful. I get it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me on, Ken. You know, you have a beautiful show. Oh, thank you. Um, it was so wonderful to have you here. I encourage everybody to to buy this book, and I encourage you to um, leave comments about your experiences with these ideas, with this episode, and with the book itself. So thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. And that's it for today's episode of Deeper Dating. Be sure to go to deeperdatingpodcast.com as Ken has a few more gifts for you. Then join us on the next episode.